RPSM Talks. 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 Uh, welcome to RPSM Talks. Uh, it's that recording thing. Okay, great. Uh, this talk to you is brought to you by Ridger Park School of Music. RPSM is a music school uh, that provides music lessons to both Region Park and Jane and Finch communities for over the past 20 years by removing financial obstacles. Uh, to learn more about the school, please visit www.rpmusic.org. Uh, my name is Thompson and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been here since day one, so you can call me a Regent Parker day one. Um, I have been a student, a board member, a teacher, and a day camp director um, at the music school. And so this is really a pleasure for me to kind of get started and really just have a wonderful uh, time and series. So thank you for joining us and please join us for the subsequent uh, talks to come after this. So today's talk is about the industry and how the industry has changed over the past few years. And so we've got uh, some wonderful guest uh, panelists with us. And uh, I will just in, uh, invite uh, Evan, uh, Evidante, Mavis Harris, and Craig Mannix to join us. I think Jazz is putting them in. I'm not controlling this Zoom stuff, so I don't know when things pop up or when, when they don't. Uh, but first of all, I'm gonna actually just ask uh, each of our panelists to one, introduce themselves, um, what their role is and really what that is. And then also where they fit in the landscape um, of an artist. So I will start with uh, Ivan Evidante. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, honored to be a part of this whole thing. Um, yeah, my name is Ivan Evidente, um, uh, representing Universal Music Canada. Um, uh, my role, actual title role there is Director of a and uh, For those who may not know, that stands for Artist and Repertoire. Um, in a nutshell, I guess you could say I scout talent, uh, develop them, sign them, and you know, hopefully break them globally. But I do that alongside with a great team of people within the building. And uh, that's sort of in a nutshell what I do. That's me. <laughs> great, and Mavis? Hi, I'm Mavis Harris. Uh, glad that everybody's here. So I am a publicist um, and I started at what was then called Maple Music as the uh, National Media Relations Manager. And then I went to Universal, so I know Ivan a bit, uh, as a communications manager. And now I'm in BC and set up my own business, uh, Nice Marmot PR, named after my favorite film, The Big Lebowski, uh, not about marmots in the mountains. Uh, and so my role with an artist is mainly securing them press. So I am their middleman between them and the media. So I book them television, radio, print, online. I build their promo schedule and I kind of help them execute it and that so that they're feeling comfortable and that uh, things are going well. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Hey, Craig. Hi, uh, my name is Craig Mannix. I am the Senior Director of Domestic uh, Urban Marketing at uh, Universal Music. Um, Basically, my job is to work with the artists that uh, Ivan signs, and uh, then we create uh, marketing plans and strategies uh, to help uh, develop the artists and develop the acts. Um, it's based, it's marketing with a little bit of promotion. That's what I do. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for uh, the little introduction. Um, so today's talk, we really want to kind of just focus on um, the music industry and where it's kind of evolved to and where we kind of see it going. And so I thought I'd probably kind of just start with my journey with music as a consumer. And so I remember start, I started off with cassette tapes, so now I'm aging myself, and then cassette tapes became, you know, CDs. 
Uh, I remember using the cassette tapes to record the radio so that I could actually save the songs. And then this thing called Napster came along, which everyone made this big deal about that was really bad. And I thought, oh, well, now I have access to music that I never had before. And then, uh, and then from there, now we kind of come to this age where, uh, you know, we're in the streaming world. And I would say along those steps, you know, technology has had a very big role in how it really affects the artists, how they, um, you know, how they reach their audience. And it'd be great to kind of just hear uh, from you guys, basically how, how those changes have happened. And now we're in an era where we actually can't even get to our audience. So how much more uh, important are those digital tools that once we stayed away from uh, in an environment like this that we're in right now? Um, so I'll, I'll just ask Craig to start us off or, and, uh, or anyone who wants to, but uh, since I'm calling you out, we'll go there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, we are in a Thompson, we're in a digital space now. So, I mean, to the point where it, it's the, it's even beyond digital, because I don't know if you know, but for the last couple of years, one of the bigger debates is, you know, um, Apple is going to stop selling, you know, digital file downloads, it, it, it's just going to convert to streaming. And, you know, now with streaming, and it being all digital, we have an influx of data that we can all use that are coming from various areas, you know, whether it be from your social media, your, um, you know, uh, your social media accounts, as well as the streaming platforms. So there's so many different places that we can get information from in order, in order to help us better target to market and promote uh, artists. And we can also, it's also a tool being used, you know, well, I won't, I won't, I will, uh, I won't answer for for eyes, but it, it, it's it's used in almost every facet that we do now. We're we're a digital world, we're a digital industry, with the exception of physical, the the last bastion of physical, which is refreshing. It's it's vinyl, so which is a kind of a niche collector's market, but for pretty much we're we're all digital. Great, thanks, Evan. Uh, sorry, Craig. Um, I was looking at you, Evan. What's uh, what's your take on that? No, I mean, I agree 100% with Craig. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I come from the era as well of, you know, the cassette tapes as well. And I might even go, you know, I, I think I might have even been around with the eight, uh, the eight track, which is even a little bit more old school. But um, absolutely, I think I agree in terms of, you know, uh, living in this digital age now, and just how just all the, the tools, I guess, that are there that provide this data for us to, you know, even from a marketing side, right down to the discovery of, of artists. Now, you know, in my particular role, you know, I, I, I still believe that word of mouth was is always something that still I, you know, rely on in terms of when I'm hearing about acts or stuff like that. But I think now, uh, to Craig's point, we just live in a world right now where there's you know, social media alone allows us to kind of just see things a lot, you know, like you, you can find out things so much quicker now, you know what I mean? And just like, you know, whereas maybe if you had asked, you know, 20 years ago when you're not maybe necessarily even finding out or discovering an act from another side of the world, you know what I mean? Now with technology and just social media alone and you, you know, it, it, it's easy to see that stuff now, right? So that's definitely plays a part in some of the discovery. Um, when it comes to discovering acts as well, which I'm sure we'll get a little bit more into after, but those are my two thoughts on that for sure. Cool. And maybe it's your thoughts. I uh, totally agree. Uh, sorry, my, uh, my connection might be a bit bad. Um, so I 100% agree. And as, uh, oh, am I there? Oh, you're, you're here. Hear me? We can hear you. Can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, there we go. Um, but from a publicist perspective too, just even as I approach building a publicity campaign for an artist, that's completely different than even what it was six years ago. It's all about being online, as I said, Spotify, you know, all the streaming services in general, good placement on blogs, kind of the prestige pieces of, let's say six, 10 years ago of like a cover of now, that's great. It doesn't do anything anymore. It doesn't move the needle. It's all the, a numbers game. It's just, for me now, my job is trying to make sure that my artist numbers are steadily building because in the digital platform. So 
kind of those grand old pieces that I personally love the most when I was starting up, it's changed. So I'm also learning and um, kind of joining my artist's team to make sure that their digital profile is just fantastic on, across the board. So actually, you know, piggybacking off of what you said, if we kind of take it down to sort of an artist level, um, for your role in particular, what would be the difference in what you did for Michael Jackson to what right now you would do for like the weekend in terms of how, in terms of your role and where, where that comes into play? Uh, that would be amazing, Michael Jackson, firstly. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know what? I'm going to actually like take that back a bit because artists at that level, it, it, for my job, it's easy. The bigger you are, the less I have to do, right? It's... Uh, it's beautiful. Like if I'm working the weekend, just like, hi, would you like to talk to Abel? Done. Right. So there's no, um, but in terms of people who are kind of mid range or trying to break, um, my focus is now off of print and off of TV. Those are still good exposures. Like they're, it's great to have, it's great for the artist's press portfolio. Um, it's nice as a keepsake. That's what I say now, right? Keep it for your scrapbook. That's fantastic. Um, so now I am just constantly chatting with Spotify and for editorial playlisting and talking to third party playlisters and making sure we can get added to playlists that can just once again up their numbers. And then when it comes to a video release, making sure that once again, everyone's directed to the same platform and that numbers are going up. So years ago, remember like those awesome much music video premieres would be like a countdown like in one week like I remember like the black and white video Michael Jackson the build-up for that and then you're just like oh like just, it was the best um not so much anymore it doesn't do anything so you're just trying to do some partnerships with YouTube itself or with Vivo um and also you don't really want one premiere partner anymore premieres are useless now as well the more eyes that see it the more numbers it builds up and so for me too, it's this weird circle of life where when I'm pitching an artist um, to TV, for example, even that still does happen, um, they'll say, where are the Spotify numbers at? Where's that at right now? Um, and then it's like, okay, so Spotify numbers are here. And then Spotify will also be like, well, what's going on over here? So I kind of got to make... We just lost that last piece of what uh, Mavis had to say, but I'm sure she'll be back. Craig, if I'm asking you the same question and not necessarily thinking about how big, you know, the Michael Jackson or the weekend is, but more thinking about the era in which, you know, getting the music out there is in the era now, what would be a, what would be a change for you? Um, well, once again, like the, the marketing focus and advertising, I mean, you know, right now, right now, the big trend with artists nowadays is they want static billboards, right? Because it's like, I want a static billboard. And I'm like, man, static billboards are expensive. And for the price you pay for a static billboard, we can get 10 digital billboards and way more impressions and blah, 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 blah. But everybody wants to get nostalgic and everybody wants that static billboard because it's kind of like old school and it also is permanent. So but that's more of a, you know, a beating your chest type thing, you know, but, you know, for the, for the focus, it's all, it's, it's, it's a YouTube true view marketing. It's, it's, it, you know, there are, even though we're in a phys, in a digital space, there is still that co-op marketing money that gets spent at retail. And what's the new retail? It's not HMV anymore. It's not, you know, Sam the Record Man or whatever the, the old school ones used to be, it's it's Spotify, it's Apple Music. And, you know, when you see, you know, when you see things like, you know, people's images on the top of the playlist or that kind of stuff, it's like, that's not by chance. Like, <laughs> that that is co-op marketing. That is, you know, it, it, you know, a lot of people, you know, you can be an independent artist and upload your stuff. Anybody can upload your stuff to the services, but you know, how easy is it? How easy will it be to, to get found? Where will it be placed? That kind of stuff. So I tell people, 
you know, it's a good time to be an independent artist because artists have, has, uh, they have the most access now that they've ever had, but you know, it still takes, it still costs money to, to move your art and move your product through the ecosystem, whether it be physical or digital. Um, it's, it's not as easy as um, a lot of people say, I was like, you know, you can do it independently. You don't need me, but you, 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 you still need the finance and the revenue to do it because, you know, a, what Mavis does is even more important now because, you know, we found, and it's a fact that, you know, uh, music blogs around the world feed into the streaming services algorithm. So if some an artist is getting uh, written about in one territory and another territory and another territory or 10 blogs write about it in Canada, it, it peaks up and there are people like, oh, there's something going on here. Let's add this to some more playlists. There's something going on with this artist around the world. So, I mean, it's just to answer your question in a nutshell, it's almost, I would say when I was starting early back in the day, it was all uh, physical, uh, traditional marketing. And then it began to change and there was a little bit of digital. It was maybe 70, 30, but now I'm thinking, you know, you flip it around, it's like 80, 20, 80% 80 of your spend would be probably um, spent on digital. And that's only if you're a big enough artist that warrants any kind of physical stuff like street posting or stuff. There's a lot of artists that it's all their marketing is digital. Interesting. So, so Ivan, you know, to what extent, so if I'm going to move over to you kind of expanding on this, um, to what extent are your A&R decisions now influenced by Spotify hits, um, you know, uh, followers? Um, one thing that uh, both Mavis and, and Craig mentioned also was kind of the YouTube world, which I don't actually think a lot of people even understand the power of YouTube, um, which is something in the recent years I've kind of started to come around to understanding um, where it kind of um, exists in the ecosystem of what of the art that you're putting out. Yeah, I mean, I think all of these sort of, you know, whether it's Spotify and, you know, Apple Music, YouTube, we're definitely looking, if, if you're asking about how we're looking for acts and stuff like that, I, think I, I honestly, of course, those are still, those are tools that we use. But I think, you know, going back to just in general, I think, especially in my role, where one thing that we're one that we're not doing, at least in the last year is like, we're not going out to see acts anymore, right, which also plays a big thing, you know, like the actual live performance part of it. So while absolutely, you know, <clears throat> we're looking at, you know, numbers on, on Spotify and, and all those that data, I mean, for me personally, at the same time, that's not what that it doesn't have to necessarily be the only driver for me personally. I mean, for one, you know, the music has to be good, <laughs> you know what I mean, for one. And then on top of that, I mean, I think there's also different factors that play into this in terms of like, you know, with the, does that artist have, you know, uh, at least a vision or some sort of idea of maybe what their North Star probably looks like and, you know, and whether it's with them or if they actually have like the right team behind them that, you know, whether it's just, you know, people who are going to help support them and sort of help get them to that vision. And that's sort of things that I personally as well look at on top of like the data stuff as well. So that's, you know, I think that's, again, it's maybe it's an old school thing, but it's sort of been, it's, it's a super important thing uh, for me. Uh, specifically and at the same time when you think about it when you start looking at at the major label side of things I think you know there's uh sometimes there could be the misconception that when one sort of gets signed to the label that like okay kick up the feet and we're all good now and it, when in fact I think um that's actually when a lot of the hard lifting starts heavy lifting sort of starts and I think uh you know even to get at that level where you know because I think I used to always say that sometimes it's not necessarily like the hard part is not just getting signed to the label. It's actually having people when you're in signed to actually champion it and to really care about it. You know what I mean? And, and I think, you know, in order for that to happen, you definitely from the artist side, also on top of the music and having a sense of the business, or at least having people on your team that understand that and what's, what's needed to kind of take that sort of vision and enhance it with the label. It's always a partnership, right? That those are things that artists need to consider for sure. So things that I look for personally. 
Very perfect. Um, I appreciate that. So I have a question, which is if, you know, if I'm a kid at uh, Regent Park School of Music or any of these music schools, but, you know, our audience right now is, is there. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of tools right now. And, and as you mentioned, it's never been sort of um, a better time to be an independent artist to get your stuff out there. What would be kind of one of your biggest opportunities uh, to to basically put out a, you know, get that platform for you. You know, I think about the fact that I'm still kind of younger, but I'm not that young. So, you know, I I know, you know, 16 year olds who have 20,000 uh, followers on Instagram. I'm like, where'd you get those followers from? How do you even know those people? So there's definitely the young people know how to kind of get that following going, how to build those numbers. Now, if we're gonna translate it to what they wanna, you know, the art they wanna produce and get out to the world, what do you think are areas right now that um, are places to either not necessarily start, but really to focus on in terms of how they present the music? Uh, you know, and I'll throw that out to um, Mavis, now that we have you back. So sorry that I was gone. Um, you know, th there are, as you said, like there's so many things and I don't want to be selling what I do short. But even things like if you're just starting small and want to get your music out there, you can do things like Submit Hub or Groover or something like that, where it's just, you know, you pay for coverage in a sense. But um, a lot of blogs are now switching over to that. Blogs that I wouldn't think would have done that before. So I'm even using some of that in my own repertoire, um, especially when somebody's breaking. But it's a good way to get those blog hits outside of Canada. So you can- I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you for one second just to ask for those two names again, cause we have Lucas who's like Googling that. So he can put together a list for all the, so for all the kids who are listening. Yeah. It was Groover Submit. and- Submit Hub. Submit Hub, okay, perfect. So you just Sorry. upload your music and then at, like choose what blogs you think fit. Um, and so I, you know, some of the baby bands that I'm starting with, um, they found that it's been really helpful. So they'll come to me and they'll be like, this is our first foray into building a team. Um, but this is what we've done. And we were able to get some small Spotify playlists and some blogs, but it's always a good start. As long as you're getting your name out there and starting to build something, I see no harm, no foul. So that, that would be my advice. Now, question for me, because I've never heard of them. What's the difference between those and like a SoundCloud? Man, so SoundCloud I find is just like, for me, <laughs> I'm, I'm just talking from a, a publicist standpoint, um, just a great way to share music privately. That's how I, <laughs> how I always use it. People send me their <laughs> private SoundCloud links and I'm able to be like, yes, now I can like disseminate it without it being leaked. Um, well, the difference is, is that, so with like, I'll just use Submit Hub, um, you upload your music as you would kind of any digital space, but then you're, you, you pay so you pick like a package to be like uh, 30, 30 bucks and that gives you 30 points and then blogs are ranked. So you can be like, mm, I'll choose this one that's worth three points or what have you. So you can pick who you're going to send it to. Um, there's also a label option. I haven't really used that because it's not what I need to do. Um, and there's also things like TikToks, like any TikTok personalities that you want to get it in front of. Uh, and I think blogs are starting to turn to that and bigger ones too, just because it's it's clearing out their inbox a bit. I know that these people. I always when she has something important to say, Paul, I don't know if you went on mute or if we just lost your audio. We may have lost your audio, but I will come back to you. Oh, so I'm I'm gonna, oh, oh, there you go. There you go. Sorry. I don't know where you lost me. Oh, sorry. Now I went on mute and started speaking. So you, <laughs> you were just, just going into the bigger blogs. Yeah. Um, just that's, yeah, there, I think why some of them are doing it and also considering moving over to these platforms is that it kind of weeds out things for them. So they're getting hundreds, if not thousands of emails a day. So now they're getting to the point where it's like, if you want access to us or our editors or our writers, you have to pay for it. Um, so people who are unwilling to pay, it's, it's a horrible way that it's going, but it's going that way, I think. So 
Um, but I would recommend it as, as a starting point if you want to just to start a little bit of buzz and just to have something in your back pocket. So even if you're just breaking and you're just starting up and you have one Spotify listener per month, um, it's a good way to just be like, well, I've been featured on these on these outlets. And I think, um, yeah, as a starting point, it's, it's, it's not that bad. Awesome. So Ivan, you know, if I'm turning the question to you, I'm a student at Regent Park School of Music. I've got a, I've been sitting in my bedroom and or hanging out with one of my fellow students. We've come up with all this music, trying to figure out how to get it, get it out there now to get your attention. Like what are the channels and not necessarily just to get your attention, but really to start to build that audience. What are some of the new opportunities um, and maybe some of the old opportunities or opportunities that weren't there before uh, that would get their music to reach you at some point? Yeah. Um, well, I think everything ultimately starts with a plan. You know what I mean? Like, and, you know, strategy is super important, you know, and, you know, Craig did mention earlier that like, you know, it, it does cost money to do all of this stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Um, but at the same time, like, uh, yeah, I think so. Let's start there. I mean, it starts with a plan ultimately, you know what I mean? And you can have as much music as you want and, and, and just, and you see it all the time. People are just putting music out there, you know? And I think that we live in this age where everything happens super quick and there's a lot more music coming out these days. So, you know, when I say plan, it's almost like, how do you think about what's going to make you sort of stick out, you know, above everything else that's out there for one. So, I mean, I think there's different, you know, so we start there with the plan and then we don't have to get into all the details of that. But in terms of if you're asking about, you know, whether just you're uploading stuff to SoundCloud, whether you're putting stuff out on Instagram, you're, you know, you're, you're on Twitter, like there, there's a whole bunch of different, obviously, you know, outlets out there. You're sort of seeing people now teasing stuff on TikTok and that's a whole other thing as well. You know what I mean? So I think really, it really just comes down to how, when it starts to get to my attention, I think it's like a lot of it, I used to always say that, like, you know, I don't necessarily think it's about an artist trying to find me. I feel like if you're doing something that's sort of, especially on a consistent basis where people are seeing it a lot more, I'll more than likely find out about it in some way, you know what I mean? Through some of the tools that we talked about as well and some of the outlets that I would look for. So I guess to answer your question, it's really like, it starts with a plan, starts with a strategy and understand that because of how fast everything moves, I think it's like, how do you, how do you also just build your fan base ultimately day by day? And that's really the important thing is kind of, you know, building fans every day and keeping them and engaging your fans as well. You know what I mean? Um, with, uh, with, with your, with your content of what it is and sort of, and, and, and really involving them in sort of, you know, getting people's feedback in terms of if you're sort of just starting out, but I think, you know, consistency is definitely one thing for sure. But again, a lot of that consistency requires strategizing there's a saying that they say if you fail to prepare prepare to fail and i i go by that all day long right so it's definitely those are my thoughts on that awesome so i'll i'll uh try and go deeper with that with you craig and just understand um or ask the question is okay you come up with a strategy and then we know we've got all these you know platforms that are out there in your opinion do you try to diversify across the platforms or do you pick one platform to kind of be your bread and butter to start with before you start to uh, start to move around. So whether it be Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, like is there is there a benefit to to really being? I mean, you have to be on all of them at some point. But is there a benefit to being more engaged on one than the other um, for any any particular reason, or do you want to just try and have the the touch points of, at all of them? Also keeping in light that for some of many of them, you can kind of just do one-on-one -on -one and it connects to all of them for you anyways. Well, I mean, it all depends on where you are as an artist, what stage you are in your career or, or what even type of artist you are. Because I mean, if you are doing hip hop or R and B, you, you could do without Facebook totally in my opinion. But if you're doing country, and pop you'll need some facebook presence but it won't it won't be a it won't be heavy but you would need some facebook presence there i mean you know it all depends on what you're doing what kind of music you're making like am i going to focus depending on what kind of artist like everybody's going to do tiktok 
but are you going to focus on TikTok? Are you going to be like, let me try to get some influencers to do some stuff. Let me do a, you know, a, a, a full advertising campaign campaign there because maybe there's something about the song that you you you're trying to market to promote that may have a lyric or may have something in there that may lend itself to to doing something on TikTok where you've been like, okay, well, we think that this can, this might be able to do well at TikTok. So let's focus on TikTok. Or at the end of the day, it, it could just be, um, you know, your regular, you know, marketing on, on uh, Instagram, you know, you can do focus marketing there. But I mean, it, the thing about it is you don't want to spread yourself too thin, especially if you're uh, an independent artist and you have a limited budget you really want to pick where it makes the most sense, right? Like, where does it make the most sense? Where can I get the most bang for my buck? And, you know, if I'm an independent artist and I'm looking about, you know, getting the most bang for my buck, you know, I, I you know, I'm still going to lean over to Mavis and be like, help elevate my brand, my name, you know, get people to write about my music. And then that will, you know, that will start things going. I always think I was, I will always tell independent artists to go that way instead of, you know, uh, oh, I've heard horror stories, you know, artists tell me they, oh, and by the way, don't buy likes, don't buy streams, because we know if they've been bought, we can find out if they've been bought, it doesn't make, it's not going to help you in the end, um, you know, and there's ways for us to look at it and be like, this just doesn't make sense. So I, when I, when, you know, a lot of artists are getting hit up by people like, oh, I can get you this many streams over here. Or I can get you this many likes on Instagram. Like, don't go down that path because that's just not the way to go. Just t take whatever you have and do something more focused that makes more sense. I get those, I get those DMs like every day on my Instagram every day. Yeah, do you want three thousand followers? And it's like, yeah, it looks, it's very inviting. But uh, I know better. I think. The uh, okay, I have one last question before we open it up to um, to some of uh, our, our our listeners and uh, people who've joined us, which is looking through sort of your glass ball, and I'm sure you hate getting this question. Question, um, and maybe it's a a bit retrospective as well, which is, you know, what used to exist. Um, that no longer exists uh, in the in terms of like the the industry, and so and what do you what are you projecting kind of moving forward? Which is you know what as as you talked about sort of the old ways of of getting the music out there, so print, newspaper, things like that. What just will not be in that sphere moving forward? Do you think um, for an artist in terms of what they need to do, how they need to get out, or what needs to be kind of a, a part of that collection? I don't know if that question was too vague, but uh, you know, I'll, uh, maybe I'm going to throw it to you and we'll see how long we have you for. <laughs> um, oh man, that's, that, that's a, a good question. And, and it's hard. Um, you're right about Prince. That's the dying beast. It's pretty much reserved now for, you got to be Mick Jagger if you want a really big print feature. Um, it's got it. You got to be a big, a big artist. Um, so that's going to be harder. Um, music reviews like the traditional classic music review is is dead too um that's going by the wayside uh so it's fully for me um a singles based arena right now um oh am i there yeah you're here you just freeze every once in a while but that's fine you're here that's okay uh, <laughs> um yeah so um for me, it's just going to be more and more singles oriented. Uh, people love, yeah, albums are awesome. I'm an album person myself. EPs are great. But in terms of generating sustainable and consistent press, that's going to give you two weeks. Go single by single by single by single and stretch that out as much as you can. Um, and I think we will kind of see a resurgence for my part, um, especially during COVID times. Stuff like, I think Sirius XM is going to become more and more important for the revenue that it produce, provides the artist. Um, so 
I'm, I'm really cognizant of that right now. I mean, people aren't working, times are really tough, but if they can get some rotation on Sirius and get a nice $3,000 check every once in a while, um, that's a big deal. So if things are still as they are with no touring and stuff, um, I, I can see that becoming a bigger and bigger deal. Um, and that's what artists are asking of me now. Like, get me on Sirius, get me on Sirius. I want that Sirius money. Um, so that's a, that's a big one. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it, it, as you said, it's, a, it's hard. It's all going to be, I think Spotify once again, if it's changed the entire game fully, um, and TikTok, someone, if you hit it on TikTok, that's amazing. So I think it's just going to be more geared toward playlists and personalities on the digital realm. Ivan. Yeah, I mean, Sorry, look, I'll, I'll echo some of the stuff that Mavis said. I think, at least it pertains to me, some of the things that I definitely, I'm already sort of seeing changing. Yeah, it pertains to my, some of the stuff that I specifically deal with, even just with producers in general, like now, like seeing a lot of these producers who are not working in the big studios necessarily anymore, not saying that that doesn't exist anymore, but you know, you're seeing a lot of producers that are just doing stuff from their home, you know what I mean? And maybe we you know, when it's coming to the, the mixing and the mastering stuff of the final product, then we take those to some of the bigger studios. So those are some changes that I'm, I'm already seeing happening, you know what I mean? Especially during this pandemic, you know what I mean? Where these, we're seeing writing sessions happen over Zoom, which is super interesting as well. So I think, you know, that shows, you know, where that could be going and who knows what the next year is going to look like. But I think in general, I think in, as far as changes, I mean, again, going back to the touring thing, I, I'm, I'm sort of curious as to see, uh, what shows are going to look like in 2022 like I, I i kind of believe that shows are going to come back in 2022 i'm hoping they'll come back in 2021 but i personally think that they're not going to come back till 2022 in my personal opinion so it's going to be interesting to see what what a live show looks like you know what i mean and if it's certain capacity i don't know you know what i mean and just even sort of how that's going to look in general from you know from maybe the way we were used to uh, of seeing it you know so those are a few things that I think uh, to be on the lookout and curious to see how things change over the next little while. Awesome, thanks a lot. And Craig, just as before we open it up to the floor, um, question I have for you is, what haven't I asked yet? You know, what is, what's important that you're sitting there and being like, yeah, no, this is really important and this guy hasn't mentioned it at all. What can we share? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we've talked about marketing and our um, press. Um, I, I would, I would say just, and this is something I tell all artists all the time is, you know, kind of know your rights try to, you know, um, you know, make sure you register all your stuff with SOCAN, um, that kind of stuff, like dotting your I's and crossing your T's and protecting your copyright, um, making sure if you get into any, into any sort of contract situation, you, you, you have um, proper representation and you're, you're fully, you, you know, you're fully walked through that contract. And, you know, when I used to do a and I, I would, I would make sure that uh, um, I'd be like, listen, man, here's the, the, the contract. If you know, make sure you get a good lawyer and I, I'm here, we will walk through every step of this contract and I will explain it to you, you know, so you understand what you're getting into that kind of thing. I, I, I would think just the whole um, like protecting your copyright legalities, stuff like that. That stuff's very important as well, but that's a that's a whole different topic onto itself. You know, especially now in the digital age, because stuff is changing and ever changing. So that's important. For sure, one, for sure. I, I, no, I was gonna say one thing I, I'd jump in and you said that we haven't necessarily talked about. Is that what sort of what the question was? And yeah, and, and I think, you know, I know we're talking a lot on the sort of artist standpoint and 
you, know, you have Mavis here on the PR side that comment that has her comments and Craig on the marketing side. But I think, you know, if, if there's something that I would mention to just anyone that's listening out there, whether you may not even be an artist and just the different opportunities, I guess, within the, the industry in itself that, you know, that uh, maybe we didn't discuss, you know what I mean? There's, there's graphic designers, there's, uh, you know, there's the, the legal department, uh, there's so many different departments within the music, well, specifically speaking at a label um, in general, there's different departments that I think, you know, um, people should look into outside of maybe just whether they're, if they're maybe not just trying to be an artist and so forth. And those are things that I think, you know, uh, that are out there, you know what I mean? And sometimes we don't necessarily think of those things because we're just thinking about like, it's just from the artist perspective, what are we doing? But again, there are yeah. different. Mm -hmm. So I don't that's, know, my two steps. No, that's totally fine. And I, I would say you're, you're jumping a month ahead because our, oh, our, 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 our next talk is who's on your team, essentially. What are those pieces that kind of come together to make uh, all this thing, this thing go forward? So, so I appreciate you saying that. It's just validating the path we're already on, you know. And I shouldn't take credit for that because that's Jazz and Stephanie. But you know, I'll take a little bit of credit for it just since I'm here. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, you know, at this time we're going to open up the floor uh, for questions from representatives of the RPSM Youth Committee. Uh, for those of who are joining us who are not part of the committee, the committee uh, is a community-wide uh, youth group for young leaders who are in high school. And virtually they meet at this time every Thursday from seven to eight um, and engage in social activities, discussions, educational workshops like this one. Um, so please feel free if you wanna to join to reach out to Jasper. Uh, his email is studentdevelopment at rpsm.org. And I will call on Jade Zia to um, ask the question. Good, good evening, everybody. Hi, I'm Jadzia. Um, and well, I have a question for, this is, this is for anyone and everyone who is able to answer it. Um, so my question is, well, maybe even 30 years ago, it was, we kind of looked down on people who use things like auto-tune and lip sync and just, that kind of style of editing your music where you would more rely on your own personal talent and skill is, I guess my question, is that something that you would still look for? Or are you looking for somebody who is, I guess has a bigger stage presence and like still has the talent, but can still look good while using auto-tune? Well, I mean, I'm not gonna hate on anybody that uses auto-tune. I mean T-Pain used auto-tune. I, I was a real big fan of T-Pain. But I do, at least for me, it is still important to have that sort of raw talent for sure. You know what I mean? There's there's a, uh, it's a very big difference of what people can do in a recording studio versus when you put them on a stage live, right? So for me personally, I think, um, you know, especially when I'm going to a, a live show, it's super important that, uh, you know, that that artist is actually at least able to hold and hold a note, you know, for me personally. But I, I wouldn't say I would necessarily look down on somebody who uses auto tune. But I, you know, because there's certain records that it just actually fits and it works. But um, you know, I think for me at least, uh, there definitely has to have that that that, that actual natural ability. Uh, it's important for me personally. I might even jump in there for a second, um, Jazia, and just say that most artists use auto-tune. What you're referring to is actually the manipulation of what's going on with, um, with, the, with the melodies, but uh, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who's, who's um, working with vocals and editing them who's not using auto-tune. <laughs> I don't know if you're trying to say something. Do you have another question? Or are we are you taking all the questions, Chedzia? Uh, sorry, my, I, I thought it was just called Autotune. Sorry. Um, is it okay? Oh no, it, I it, ask it, a question. Definitely, definitely. Um, this is for Ivan. I know before. Um, you talked a bit about. Um, making a plan. I was just asking, I know you probably can't get into all the details, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit more on what that would look like. Yeah, I think, oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so with plan, I think, you know, 
Uh, I mean, just kind of talking on the bare stuff about it, like meaning like the bare bones without having its full full detail. But I'm saying, for example, if you have, you know, uh, a single number one sort of uh, that you you have a certain time that you want to release that. And when I say a plan, it's like, okay, what are the things that you're going to put around that to sort of help get that word out there? You know, so whether it's a uh, you know, let's, if we're talking from a project thing, when you talk about a rollout plan, for example, if you know, for example, what the first single is going to be, if for whatever, let's just say you have a plan to create a visual for it, whether that's a music video for it, you know, having a sense of when that's going to release, is that going to be coming out when the song is released? Are you going to drop the video at the same time? Is it going to be a week after that? What are some of the pieces that you're going to use on your social media to help be promoting that? Um, whether that's, before the actual record comes out, you know, whether you're teasing people with that on your socials, whether you're going to be doing, um, you know, engaging sort of the fans that you've been building along the line to kind of sort of help you kind of build the hype around a particular single. Um, and then uh, maybe the planning and part of that as well starts to come into sort of what's the next single that's going to be coming out? What's the timing of that going to look like? How are you going to, you know, pivot from the first single that you put into and, and sort of, you know, get everything ready, sort of planned up, lined up before you drop the next single? When's that right time? And, and I think what I've learned in this business a lot is things change all the time. But again, I think if you have at least a good sense of even if it's first, you know, and Craig, you jump in here at any time. We were talking about an act that we're, we're talking six months ahead already, seven months sometimes of what that plan could look like in terms of which single is going to come out, what pieces of content are going to be coming up for that, when we're dropping that, who are we part, you know, different opportunities. Is there going to be brand partnerships that we're going to try to uh, uh, partner with on single number three? So there's all these different things. So I guess when I talk about plans, it's just really um, kind of just, you know, at least kind of knowing what the next few steps are going to look like and, and giving yourself enough time to prepare all the content that you're going to need. So when these things start to come out, you know what I mean? Because I think what happens a lot is, uh, well, I've seen it a lot is, you know, an act will put out something and they'll be like, yeah, guess what? I, I, I'm getting ready. I'm going to have another single, but they don't actually have the single ready yet, or they don't have any thought of when it's, you know, yeah, it's just a follow-up, I guess, and staying consistent because, I think once you sort of put stuff out there, like it goes right. And, and, and it's like, and you got to keep up. And if you can, again, I, I use the word consistency in that sense. I think if you can be consistent and be able to stay in people's faces enough and, and actually with stuff that's engaging that people care about um, a lot of that, again, that takes planning. And, it, and yeah. So I don't know, Craig, if you, if you have, yeah. any thoughts on that. I mean, yeah, I, I, I think you hit on pretty much everything. I mean, every, Everything that's uh, that you see has been that you see when you see something come out on 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 Fridays for the most part on new release Fridays. You know the the just to give you an idea, the 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 aggregators, the streaming services, they've had that that music you know four to six weeks ahead of time. Like they've been sitting with it. Um, some acts even longer. Like if it's a big anticipated album or or whatever, like you know some 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 of these like, oh yeah, you, you know you talk to somebody at Apple, oh yeah, I've been listening to, I've had that album for two months. It's like oh okay, but that's the time that they need to populate the the music within their within their ecosystem. So for instance, like you know a Apple will talk, you know they have all the all the urban programmers, all the urban playlisters in every territory around the world, they they have meetings, weekly meetings, and they talk about music and they talk about, oh, well, this artist is coming out in my territory. Oh, you know, oh, let's hear it, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's cool. Maybe that's something will work here. So it takes time to um, populate uh, uh, the, the, the services. So not just that, it takes time for everything. Like it takes time to, you know, plan ahead for the media. It takes time to plan ahead for, for uh, advertising. Um, you know, before it's a little bit easier now in the digital era, but before, you know, you'd have companies buying up blocks of, of TV time before like Christmas, right? So there's like the buy up all the slots and they'll do all their Christmas advertising. They're doing that in, you know, I remember we'd start working on Christmas campaigns 
in July. Right? Like you start talking about Christmas in July because at that time in the in the business, it was it was our biggest biggest uh biggest quarter, which was the Christmas quarter, right? So um in a digital era era, not so much. I mean, we used to follow a lot of different types of rules, like you know, no one would want to get released in the middle of summer, like how can you advertise to people in the middle of summer? There's no uh, care around, music, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? So, I mean, it, it's, it's make, keep it just, yes, just to add to everything that I've said, you got to map everything out and plan it and be ready. You don't release a single without having the next one ready. You don't, you don't release it and be like, oh, what are we going to do? You know, because guess what? Mixing, mastering getting everything together, the artwork, you know, getting ingesting. It takes a week to get ingested into the system. You know, that takes time before you know it, you're, you know, you're a month and a half, two months between singles and then people have lost interest. Craig, I had a quick question just to follow up on that, which is, um, does that depend on the type of artist you are, whether you can go down a single route or um if or if you go down the album route and this is it starting to not matter anymore um unless you are drake the weekend uh you know like don't think you can just be released or you should not release you know and ives you can jump in any time you should not release a, a you know a 12 track album um it's it's one of those things like You've got to you've got to feed the demand. If you know, I tell artists, especially developing artists, new artists, you know, don't waste your music, because guess what? If you take those twelve tracks and break them into three four-track EPs, you can stretch that your moment. You can stretch your moment from. Oh, here's my release. Here's my album, which will you know depending, you know, you make some noise for a week or two or a month, right? you know, then you can stretch that from that month. You can be like, oh, here's my boom. I'm going to release one single, two singles, boom, first EP. You've then, you've then stretched out that, that, you know, two weeks to six to eight weeks. And then you, you can, and, and that way you have singles coming all the time. You have a fresh EP coming all the time. People won't lose interest, you know, and they, and then you can always have something new coming to, to stretch that out. So guess what? So your, your 12 track album, instead of being released at once and having people's attention for a month and a half, you've, you've, you've um, stretched those 12 tracks out to a year, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Don't waste your music. You know, you know, it, it's, it's a proven fact. You throw out an album, even the biggest artists go down and look at the look at the streams. You know, the streams are high the first three, four, five songs. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they it dip. Go down. Yeah. They dip. People don't have the attention span. Nowadays it's sad to say to listen to 12 tracks. You know, so that's what it is. And I think to your point, Craig, again, it's like when you're spreading it out like that, it's giving you as well the opportunity to build your fan base, build your fan base, keeps building every time. And then what you'll, you know, you'll be surprised is a lot. And I'm sure a lot of us already know this is that, you know, you'll go back to older music or new fans come on and they, they kind of go back to the older stuff. So it's, it just keeps building. And to, to Craig's point, it's about stretching it out. And for me, at least the reality is it's like, it's, it's with the amount of music that comes out in general, if you're a brand new artist that I've never heard of you throwing 12 songs at me all at once is just like, I'm, there's no way, like I, I'm not listening to this, you know? So, uh, you know, Craig brought up a really good point. It's like, you sort of build that demand, you know, and you can do them, whether it's song by song, whether it's, it's, it's three songs at first and, you know, so. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I forgot to thank uh, Jedzia for her question. I'm just going to open up to one more question from the audience before we start to wrap this up. If there's anybody, uh, I know there's some stuff coming through the chat. Uh, let me get back through. Um, oh, who said I do? Akeem. All right. 
let me know. What's your question? Yes, good evening. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And I thank you all for uh, sharing a lot of your gifts of knowledge. Um, my question is a very deep question and it's a two part question and it's open to anyone on the floor. Um, Mavis, I'd love to hear from you actually uh, because I, I want to hear, I haven't heard from you as much. So love to hear your point. But once again, it's open to anyone on the floor. So the question I have is, have you ever felt, um, have you ever felt, or have you ever been in that place where you felt very alone? And that was the place and space where you were able to like, how did you get through that, that alone feeling? Um, Cause some people, when they feel alone or they feel like they're not hurt or something like that, they usually tend to like work on their craft to be able to build. But um, uh, in this case, you, you know, I don't know about, Y'all, that's the reason why I'm asking this question. Like, have you ever felt that sense of like feeling alone? And what did you do to be able to not feel so alone? Or what did you do to be able to allow your time to be more productive? And then the second part to that is how do you go about uh, balancing um, life with all the things going on and having that uh, self-care for yourself as well? How do you go about balancing that in your daily life? Uh, that's an awesome question. And deep, you were right. Um, definitely. I've had moments where I felt alone, um, felt unheard and felt like I wasn't doing good enough. And in those moments, what I tried to do and still do, I still have those. Hell, I had one yesterday, uh, was learn. The more I can like feed my brain with new information that's positive, that's going to benefit me and how I do my business and how I do my job, that kind of, it gives me hope and it knows that I'm still, I'm still going forward. The more I learn, the more I take in, I'm going forward. So be it about, you know, your, your art or even something personal, I always say like, learn, get that knowledge in your head. It's, it's the, the best way for sure. And I think in this business too, when you talk the second part of the question about work-life balance, dude, so hard. When I first started, I gave my life to this job. I was like getting paid nothing at the very beginning when I was like 23 years old. And I was like, man, you need me 18 hours a day. I'm here. I'm here. Then I got to 28. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do this anymore. And so now, you know, boundaries, boundaries. There are things that I do not tolerate. And if that's, that's, that's okay. I mean, you know, people will, all the artists will reach out to me on like a Sunday night. I'm like, no, I'm not talking to you. This is my time to watch John Oliver with my husband and have some wine. <laughs> like, I am not doing it. So I think setting boundaries, because in this industry, people expect all of you. And that's cool. But to give all of you, you need to take time for yourself and make sure that you're able to give that 110% because you'll get burnt out fast. Um, especially one that in normal non COVID times, it's so social too. So you're out all the time. You're kind of what I call I'm on like, eh, like that takes, that takes a bit. So it's, I make, damn sure that I, I take time. And even on weekdays where I could continue working till 1am. Nope. I don't care if I have to wake up and it's going to be an extra busy day for me. I'm done at 930. I'm done. Unless it's like a crazy press day or something. If it's just a normal day of the week, give myself that time to breathe, read, hang out, hang out with my kids, my husband. So that's so important. Set those boundaries because people will, people will trample them if they can. I love that you said your workday ended at 930, but you're still giving yourself time to do other things. That's <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time, man. Sometimes I'm like, it's four o'clock. Bye. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, not to cut you guys off, just because uh, I'm looking at the time. Um, I want to, one, first of all, thank you uh, for being a part of this. But uh, Ivan Evidante, Mavis Harris, uh, Craig Mannix, um, really, I want to just big shout out to Richard, big shout out to Jasper um, and to Stephanie. I'm extremely somebody who I said it from the top, 
you know, been here since day one. Um, I'm really excited about the holistic approach that the music school has taken to supporting um, the students. And really, you know, as someone who's studied at, at music schools, just going through the music school and then at the end of it, it's sort of how do I make sense of what just happened? Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for one, being the first ones on here, but really just helping us along this journey of making this all make sense, figuring out what's in the ecosystem, figuring out where our art belongs, um, and figuring out actually just the roles, if you know, because not everybody's going to want to be the artist in front of, but there's a way for them to interact with this. So again, thank you very much for, for helping us get this going. Um, as well, uh, Richard's already said it, uh, RSVP for March 25th, and uh, that topic will be who's on your team. Uh, so we chatted about it. So we're going to be speaking with a lawyer, uh, agent, manager, just understanding what are the different roles, whether you're hiring somebody to do it or if you have to do it yourself, but understanding these are kind of jobs that need to get done to help you uh, move forward. Uh, and then Jasper will be sharing this video for uh, youth committee people. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, have a great evening and um, you know, stay safe.